So I'm going to be speaking a little bit about the Mexican scenario and also about harm reduction and human rights in nicotine and tobacco use. And anyone can feel free to contact. Um, I think this way I can get out of there. There we go. Um, so, so at Instituto Ria, we have primarily focused, um, and we like to call it full spectrum harm reduction. And so while this is harm reduction in the traditional sense of how do we um, reduce possible risks that people are taking in their consumption of both um, legal and illegal drugs, although we have obviously been primarily focused on currently illegal drugs. Um, we also talk about how do we reduce the harms of policies? How do we understand that many of the policies that our governments are putting into place um, cause harm in the lives of people? Um, some of those who are, who are using these substances and oftentimes many people who are not um, necessarily using the substance, but that might be engaged in some way in the um, in the licit or illicit markets um, that exist. And obviously, coming from Mexico, we also have uh, many people who are, are harmed by prohibition and by a lack of regulation around um, psychoactive substances that have uh, grave consequences within uh, our justice system that have grave consequences within development, within the capacity of people to really be able to um, think about the livelihoods that they want for their life, for their um, for their families and for their communities. Um, and so we really look at it from a very broad based. Uh, and I've I heard some of the previous speakers talking about harm reduction, so I don't think I need to talk too much about it. But how do we really also think about the policies and reducing harm that they do? And then the other piece, the component that I think is important to bring up is how do we manage pleasure? And in Spanish, it maybe works better that term of gestionar placer, ¿no? ¿Cómo gestionamos placer? How do we ensure that there? it's not only about reducing risks and harms, but understanding that with greater information, with a greater understanding of what you're consuming, with, with more responsible consumption, you will enjoy it more. And that might also reduce certain risks that you have. Um, so this is something that we've been, that we explore as a means of, of, of really having a, a much broader uh, framework around harm risk and harm reduction. Um, as I said, we've been primarily focused on currently illegal drugs. However, we also, are, we also work around um, the use of alcohol and the use of tobacco and nicotine. Um, we've, we have noticed, obviously, around this, that there's these contradictory discourses by governments where maybe they are taking a harm reduction perspective, possibly only in discourse, not in action. Um, uh, around illegal drugs, but that with legal drugs, they're unwilling to have that conversation. And as my colleague and Alejandra's colleague, Julian Quintero said, you know, they have one message around uh, uh, nicotine and tobacco use, which is you either quit or you die. Those are the two streams. Those are the, your two options. And there's nothing around harm reduction and there's nothing around um, really, uh, you know, providing information um, to people uh, who, who are consuming these substances beyond this is, you know, as, as another colleague said, uh, advertising terrorism, you know, where it's only that you're putting these images that are, that are visually very, very difficult to, to take in on the packaging. Um, and so we need to be able to be able to highlight these contradictory discourses by governments and propose new strategies, no? And, and that's what I think we're trying to do both in this session and then also um, as a region, thinking about how do we take down this, this, this dichotomy that they've put on the table. And I would say there's also a dichotomy about, um, about the funding around these discourses. And I'm sure other folks in, this, um, in these sessions, in these previous sessions have brought it up. You know, it's like there's the Bloomberg funders where it's you must abstinence quit or the tobacco industry. And there's no, there's no middle ground. And so really folks are having to take very strong positions one way or the other. And then you're either accused of, you know, being this, these prohibitionists that are on one side or in with the industry on the other side. So really, I think there's a lot more nuance that needs to be brought out in the political discourse. Um, so conventional cigarettes, as we know, they contain tar, carbon monoxide, and other chemicals, but why aren't other alternatives available? And especially in our region, which we're gonna talk about today. Um, and we have, we have studies that have not necessarily been, um, the, as the government would say, with conflicts of interest, 
where it shows that you know heat not burn devices have lower cancer uh, potencies and that we really need to be working on how do we how do we engage an understanding that some of those products and those devices might be might reduce risk and harm for people who are using and then another topic that i'm not going to be able to get into because we have such short amount of time today is really around who would transition with proper regulation to some of these products it might you know currently the cheapest products on the market are conventional cigarettes. That's what folks have access to. And in my context, for example, they sell single cigarettes. And so that's what people with scarce resources are buying, a single cigarette as they go to work or back and forth. And so who would possibly transition if there was greater access and if it was more, um, if it was more uh, cost effective to get some of these other products if they were, if they were, um, if they were equal to how much cigarettes, conventional cigarettes currently cost. So um, why do people use nicotine? They use it and tobacco, they use it because of the same other uh, substance that we use other substances because there is a sense of increased well-being. Perhaps though, we have focused on that uh, we haven't provided education around the consumption. So then we have to think about when you are smoking a cigarette or when you are vaping or when you are using an electronic cigarette, are you, you know, in the moment enjoying it? Are you, or is it a stress relief? And so then it also inclines, it, it, it combines with conversations that we need to be having bigger conversations around how do we live in the moment of what we're doing? You know, we, we know that when people inhale um, whatever they're using, uh, they tend, it does relax them because you take a deeper breath than you would in just in your normal breathing. And so we need to think about that. How are we, we can't just take something away from somebody that is providing well-being to them. We would have to, one, consider alternatives, or two, really think about how do we just create better understanding and awareness of what we're using and we're putting in our bodies. Um, and, and so, under Mexican law, only one form of administration is currently allowed, which is conventional cigarettes. No other, no other form of administration. And obviously, um, you know, in Mexico, we've started exploring what would it look like to really think about, you know, who has tobacco plants in their home? What would cultivation of tobacco and you being able to think about, like, how would I use tobacco in different forms of administration, um, which links it to the traditional use of how um, traditional communities and indigenous communities have been able to use it in many ways. There's a total lack of participation of people who use nicotine and tobacco and the policies that affect them. This is damaging to the human rights of those people. We recognize that and we're, we're, we're thinking about how do, you, how do you engage that? And we see it within our own government that they're unwilling to open that space. And obviously there's an exclusive focus on possible underage use without considering the human rights of people who use nicotine. In Mexico, this concept of the, of the right to the free development development of personality has been used often and, and is in the jurisprudence around cannabis use. And so I think we need to be thinking about how that can also be uh, used within uh, tobacco and nicotine use. So in Mexico, just to give a quick panorama, because I know I'm running out of time already, um, in February 2020, there was a presidential decree that prohibited the importation of vaporizers. This was a response to the U.S. crisis around uh, illegal uh, vaping of cannabis products that had, well, illegal cannabis products that had vitamin E added to them. So obviously this didn't even have anything to do with uh, nicotine or tobacco use, but this was the, the catalyst for that. And being neighbors to the United States, obviously this, um, what happens there has a great impact on our national policies. In July, 2021, um, there was a supposed lifting of the prohibition on the importing of heated tobacco products, um, but not so fast because then the, the president later that day said, no, anything that harms health will not be allowed. So there's also been this, this kind of clash of, wait, in the you can't prohibit this based on our import-export laws, but then the president says, no, you can, and they find a way to continue to have that prohibition. Electronic cigarettes were already illegal since May 2008 when the general law for tobacco control was passed. Um, but this this took the prohibition to a higher uh, to a higher level with the presidential decree in Mexico. 1.5 million said people said they had vaped in the last year in, in the uh, national survey on uh, use uh, in 2016 2017. 15 million people said they smoked. So there really is an opportunity to reduce risks and harms by having that transition happen from 
smoking conventional cigarettes, but it all remains to be seen. There was a legal case in November 2020, which allows a certain company to still sell their tobacco heating devices on a national level, but that's because they won a court case. And so really there's also um, a, dis there's, there's a disjointedness about what is the um, access to the market, the current market. And when we think about the reality of the current market, it's online sales, it's unregulated sales, irregular substances that are put into these devices, and it's difficult to assure quality controls. And so this is something that's very important that we need to be switch, you know, how do we really put health at the center instead of putting prohibition at the center, which has been the focus of the US government, of, of the Mexican government. So the Mexican Supreme Court also determined that that allowing e-cigarettes and other devices that are used exclusively for tobacco should be allowed. But they upheld the prohibition on commercializing products that could be used to consume other substances. And this is obviously their response to, well, we don't want people using cannabis, which is still currently illegal in Mexico or other substances. And we come, you know, these things come out in the newspaper of, well, people are going to be able to vape methamphetamine if we allow this to exist, you know? So it's, there's also a real um, misinformation that's, that's, uh, that's provided around this issue. And then the health secretary currently denies that there are fewer risks from non-combustion. If you go to our commissioner on um, addictions, his Twitter, the last two posts that he has are about this issue that are, and he, and they have videos where they're saying there is no scientific evidence that is free from conflict of interest. Again, demonstrating that there is no evidence, there are no studies that are done without the tobacco industry being involved that shows that these products are less damaging to health or that they facilitate abstaining from smoking. And so they're really ignoring a lot of the evidence that other countries are seeing. And I think it's, it's, you know, we're going to be doing our advocacy work to try and have them understand a bit more about this, but it is definitely an uphill battle because of the bias that already exists. Um, so some of our recommendations, and this is also the current recommendations from the government and the current initiatives that are in the different, uh, the Senate or in the Congress are to increase taxes, prohibit online sales, and prohibit any flavors. So really they have one, one mode of of going at this. Um, there's no harm reduction considered, only abstinence. Um, and when we think about what could be at the table, it's really about how do we include uh, providing high quality alternative products, heat, not burn devices, cigarettes, vaporizers, even snuff as an interesting idea. Um, commercialized products in specialized stores where harm reduction information and interventions can be provided to users. So how do we really, instead of pushing you know, users who, who might be vaping or using other products out into this illegal market, why are we not bringing them closer to health institutions, which is the same message that we have really around, um, around illegal substances as well. How do we educate doctors in the medical profession regarding these alternatives, um, including patches, gum, and therapy, but also thinking about what is it that the the, the user might, they enjoy inhaling. There is something relaxing to that, to that process. And, and, and then this is, you know, really our recommendation about all substance use, whether it's illegal or legal or um, unregulated, which is meeting people where they're at, not where you want them to be. We want to ensure that any person has access to what they think they want and need that they also have access to information so that they can help inform their decisions about their body, but that really they have the autonomy and the sovereignty around their body and the tools to be able to do that. Also, I'm speaking about this as people who are adults, not underage. Um, and so, but this is something that we, we need to be focusing on. Rather than thinking that you can just scare people into making changes, really you need to meet them where they're at, offer them information, offer them interventions, offer them alternatives. And when they're ready, when they want to make those changes, they will do that transition um, or not. And it's up to them because we really should have autonomy over our own selves. And with that, um, I'm going to stop because I know we have great presentations on the way. <laughs>